All right. We're going to review key decisions from Supreme Court's October term, <clears throat> 2021 through 2022, and also talk just very briefly about cases to keep your eye on in the uh, coming term, or the current term, I should say, October term, 2022. If you have any questions about any of this, be sure that you get a hold of us. More than happy to talk with you. Stop by our offices, email us. We're, uh, we're always happy to talk about these uh, cases and where we think the court might be headed. 2021-2022, <clears throat> this is what the court looks like. One major change, of course, at the end of the term. Now, just a, a few statistics about the court's term. The court decided 66 cases. It's really down a little bit from the usual number the court decides. 58 after oral argument. And of course, as you well know, many of these cases were decided the last couple of weeks of the term. 19 of the cases, about 30% of the rulings on the merits were decided by a 6-3 vote. And out of those 19 cases, 14 were what you might call, or what SCOTUS blog calls, polarized decisions. So a Republican pointed to justice, justices in, in the uh, majority of six. And Democrat appointed justices in the dissent in those cases. Now, key findings, uh, there's a decline of unanimity. I and mean, I guess maybe that's not surprising. Only 29% of the cases this term were decided unanimously and that's the lowest in two decades. Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh were in the majority most often, 95% of the uh, time, 93% non-unanimous cases. And of course, as you might expect, Justice Sotomayor was in the majority in 58% of the court's decisions and, and most often in dissent, 41% of the non-unanimous uh, decisions. So she dissented 27 times. Okay, now key cases to look out for. Um, or I'm sorry, key cases that we're gonna be talking about this time. Dobbs, Bruin case, Second Amendment case, Carson versus Macon, and the Kennedy case are religion cases. Shirtliff is a uh, First Amendment case. And then the remaining three cases are gonna be covered by Professor Conar Steenberg. Now cases to watch for this term. These are really interesting cases, uh, all of them. The first two in particular are, not quite sure how to, uh, how to describe them. These are, the, these are the affirmative action cases. And I've spent really a substantial amount of time <clears throat> looking through these cases, the lower court opinions, which are quite lengthy, uh, the briefs in the case, the oral arguments, there are five hours of oral arguments. And when you listen to the oral arguments, I, I think probably the conclusion that you will come away with is that affirmative action is a dead issue. And that uh, schools will no longer be able to take race into consideration as a factor in a holistic admissions process. And I think the court very likely will say that diversity in higher education is not a compelling governmental interest. And that means that colleges and universities come the tail end of June, are gonna be scrambling, but actually we're already thinking about what we're going to do at our law school, but colleges and universities are going to be scrambling to try to determine just exactly what they might be able to do in admissions process, uh, the, the admissions processes, to try to retain at least some degree of diversity in higher education admissions, it's gonna to be tough. 303 Creative versus Alinas, it's yet another sort of masterpiece cake shop case. Also coming out of Colorado. Question in this particular case is whether or not Alinas, who wants to do wedding videos, has to do wedding videos for same-sex couples. So here we go again. Um, Court's going to, I think, directly take on the question of whether or not religious rights trump anti-discrimination laws. Sackett, Professor Konar Steenberg can talk about this as a Clean Water Act case. 
Health and Hospital Corporation of uh, Marion County is an interesting case. And the question is whether the violation of a federal statute, which allows uh, people to currently sue um, nursing homes, uh, can be brought under Section 1983, the Civil Rights Act of 1871. It's a major case. The courts, I think, has indicated some skepticism uh, about the arguments against. And so I'm certainly hoping that the court will retain 1983 is a potential remedy in cases involving violations of really critical statutes. This is the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act in this particular case. And then Moore versus Harper, a really significant case involving the independent state legislature doctrine. And if the court takes that position, then state Supreme Courts will have nothing to say about um, restricted voting legislation. The independent state legislature doctrine suggests that only the legislatures in the states can decide what voting rights are and they can't be reviewed by states under the state constitution. Well, all right. So Holland case, Holland versus Brackeen is the Indian Child Welfare Act case and it involves the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And I'm not sure what the court's going to do with that case. It has been argued. All right, so to get to the cases, this is the court now. There's one major decision or one major change, I should say, and that's the addition of Justice Jackson to the court. There are now four women on the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Jackson is the first woman of color, first black woman, I should say, to be appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. It's quite interesting to hear her operate during oral arguments. Uh, she's really quite aggressive, uh, quite spirited, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, dead on in her questioning of the uh, lawyers and cases before her. All right, first case, substantive due process. Well, this is the Dobbs case, and you're all aware of what Dobbs did. The case involves Mississippi Gesta Gestational Age Act, and it adopts a 15-week cutoff for abortions. The court held that the statute is constitutional. 6-3 opinion, and in doing so, the court overrules Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Roe was decided in 1973, Casey in 92. All right, now, Justice Alito in brief says this, Roe and Casey must be overruled. There's no reference in the Constitution to abortion, no rights implicitly protected by the Constitution, certainly not the due process clause. Now, one thing that you might do is to sort of play history and tradition bingo here. Every time you hear me talk about history and tradition, just make a check mark, all right? So here's the first time, actually the second time. Any right that's gonna be protected under the constitution has to be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. A quote that comes actually from Washington versus Glucksburg. Implicit in the concept of ordered liberty comes from Pelical versus Connecticut, but deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Chief Justice Roberts really strives mightily for some middle ground in this case. He says the reason that we granted cert is to decide whether or not this statute is constitutional. Now, to do that, we don't have to overturn. Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Now he pretty clearly rejects the notion of a cutoff based upon viability. And he's expressed that opinion in other decisions. Viability doesn't make sense, but 15 weeks does. He just prefer to stick with that particular issue and decide no other issue, all right? And of course, he's voted down. Now, why were Roe and Casey wrong? There's a, a fairly lengthy analysis in the Dobbs case based on stare decisis. But this is really the essence of the case, plus one other factor that I'll mention. Unenumerated rights, history and tradition. Abortion doesn't fit. There's no historical or traditional support 
for any kind of a fundamental right of abortion. And these rights are different from all other fundamental rights because another life is involved. Okay, well, that takes care of it. Plus the court says there's no concrete reliance. Not the kind of reliance that Justice O'Connor is talking about, people structuring their lives. The culture that's developed based upon reliance that people have access to abortion. There has to be concrete reliance, and there isn't any. People don't engage in sexual relationships realizing that if something goes wrong, they'll certainly be able to get an abortion. That's concrete reliance. Starry decisis doesn't support Roe and Casey. And so he ends the opinion where he begins it. Those decisions are overruled <clears throat> and we now return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. And you've seen what's happened since Roe versus Wade was decided. You've seen what's happened in the states, several states now passing legislation or adopting constitutional provisions that enshrine the right of abortion in state constitutions or in state law. Um, but there's a patchwork now of laws in the states regulating abortion. And we could spend the next several hours just talking about those particular issues. Okay, but the key here is that Roe and Casey are overruled. Now, the standard of review, what happens? With Roe and Casey, there was something, well, it was heightened review, strict scrutiny under Roe versus Wade, and an undue burden standard under Casey. It certainly fell short of what we understand to be strict scrutiny, but it was more than rational basis review. Now, rational basis review. It's the same standard of review that would apply to any state legislation or regulations that uh, involve economic or social regulation, rational basis review. And that means the law has to be sustained if there's a rational basis on which the legislature could have thought that it would serve legitimate state interests. <clears throat> now, this is a listing of the uh, legitimate state interests that the court set out. And it seems to me that we really don't have to look beyond number one, respect for and preservation of prenatal, prenatal life at all stages of development. That's gonna give state legislatures, which are gonna to go to work now after the uh, elections are over the midterms, respect for and preservation of prenatal life at all stages of development will give states significant ability to regulate and I think prohibit abortions, should they choose to do so from the point of conception. So we'll see what happens. But rational basis review, no longer heightened scrutiny. <clears throat> now, what about other rights? In particular, the right of same-sex marriage in Obergefell versus Hodges. Well, Justice Alito says that other fundamental rights don't involve the destruction of potential life. Justice Kavanaugh says Obergefell and other substantive due process cases um, aren't in any way implicated by the overruling of Roe versus Wade. They don't threaten, or that decision doesn't threaten or cast doubt on those precedents. Okay, well, we'll see. All right, but at least for now, it looks as if Obergefell versus Hodges is safe. A lot of people have pointed to Justice Thomas's opinion, suggesting that Obergefell was wrong. Well, that's Justice Thomas's opinion. It's not an opinion that seems to be shared by a majority of the justices on the court. All right, the Second Amendment. These cases are really interesting. And Justice Thomas has been waiting a long time to get another Second Amendment case. And the Bruin case is it. And it's really interesting to see what the court did in this case. Second Amendment says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. All right. Those two clauses for a long period of time were read together. <clears throat> now they're severed. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's a fundamental right. It has nothing to do with a well-regulated militia. According to the uh, Supreme Court, 
in uh, Heller versus Doe, and Heller was applied to the uh, states in uh, McDonald versus City of Chicago. Now, in this case, New York Sullivan Law really made it hard to get a public carry license. It had to be proper cause, no statutory definition, but New York court said this means a special need for self-protection, distinguishable from that of the general community. So it's really hard to get a carry permit in New York. Now, most states, and that includes Minnesota, are shall issue states. So if you, if you um, want to get a permit, you go through training, and then the state shall issue, no choice. And it's not particularly difficult to get a permit. Some states, you don't even need a permit. So here's Heller and McDonald. Now the whole thing in the case, Justice Thomas, again, another 6-3 opinion, says that if conduct is covered by the Second Amendment, then the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. To regulate it, government has to show that the regulation is consistent with the nations, and here we go again, historical tradition, firearm regulations, one more check mark. This test requires courts to determine whether modern firearms regulations are consistent with the Second Amendment's text and historical understanding. Now, as applied, New York's law is unconstitutional. Now, the methodology, Heller, centers on constitutional text and history. There's no sort of means and analysis, no balancing that's involved under the Second Amendment. Of course, for those of you who have taken constitutional law of liberties, you realize that as a general proposition, the First Amendment cases, for example, there's going to be weighing and balancing of interests in many cases to determine whether or not government can regulate speech. All right, not so in the First Amendment, no balancing. If the right's presumptively protected, then government's got to show that the regulation is consistent with history and tradition. All right, so the burden that people have, and it's really interesting to see how this plays out, and I'll point that out in just a minute. The burden is going to be on government to uh, generally point to historical evidence about the reach of the First Amendment. Same thing in Second Amendment cases. Now, I think Justice Thomas is being not only deceptive, but disingenuous in referring to, to the history of First Amendment regulation. United States versus Stevens, for example, is, uh, involves a uh, regulation of an animal cruelty statute, which was really intended to get at crushed videos. Uh, and you can look that term up. I don't want to get into what they are. It's pretty disgusting. All right. So he says that in determining whether or not government has the right to uh, regulate, they have to try to fit regulations that are content based into a historic and traditional category of constitutionally unprotected speech. Well, here we're not going back to Bracton like we did in, uh, or like the court did in, uh, in the Dobbs case. These exceptions are really relatively recent vintage. And really what that does is to indicate that history and tradition is really quite malleable in the court's opinion. Well, why historical analysis then? Why not look at the Constitution as a living Constitution? Well, he says historical analysis might be hard, but reliance on history to inform the meaning of constitutional text is, in the court's view, more legitimate and more administrable than asking judges to decide, in this case, about costs and benefits of firearms. So in general, an analysis that focuses on history and tradition is really intended to provide an anchor in the Constitution. And there are many forms of originalism, but this is one form of originalism. What was the understanding at the time? Second Amendment was adopted. Okay, now, what about weapons that weren't in existence when the Bill of Rights and 14th Amendment were adopted? Well, constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope that they were understood to have when the people adopted them. That's one version of originalism, original meaning. So Second Amendment's going to extend all instruments to constitute bearable arms, even if they weren't in existence at the time. And the court's going to use analogical reasoning to solve the problems. What that means is that government's going to have to identify 
a well-established and representative historical analog in order to be able to regulate firearms, not a historical twin, but a representative and established historical analog. All right, so maybe regulation isn't necessarily a dead ringer, might be analogous enough to pass constitutional muster. Okay, well, the holding, the definition of bear can't be confined to the home. Second Amendment's plain text, he says, presumptively guarantees petitioners a right to bear arms in public for self-defense. All right. So the regulation is unconstitutional. Well, are, are there any limitations? And Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh say, sure, longstanding prohibitions historically on possession of firearms by felons, carrying firearms in sensitive places, imposing conditions on the commercial sale of arms, or the right to keep and bear arms covering the sorts of weapons in common use at the time. All right, so tell me what you think about this. And the upper left is a uh, drum for a nine millimeter and ordinary clip for a nine millimeter might hold 13 or 15 bullets. This clip holds 50. And you can go to most gun shops and buy these 50, 50 bullet uh, drums. Um, upper right, it's a picture of an MP4, semi-automatic assault rifle. Do they fit? And down at the bottom, what about a rocket pill, a rocket pill grenade launcher? Or what about Times Square? Is this a sensitive place? And of course, I love the way the New York governor is pushing back at the uh, Second Amendment. So New York is now pushing regulations that regulate sensitive places. Times Square is a sensitive place. Is that gonna be okay? There's a lot of litigation in these cases, but I'll tell you what, this is really scary. These are cases coming out of Texas and West Virginia. What about a prohibition against permits to carry for uh, people who are 18 to 20 years old? All right, so what do you think about that? What about the transportation or possession of firearms with serial numbers that are removed? Or what about prohibiting people who are under protective orders from possessing firearms? All right, well, all of these cases have one conclusion in common. They're all unconstitutional under the Second Amendment, applying a history and tradition analysis. It's required now by the Bruin case. All right, First Amendment and religion. <clears throat> now there is a tension between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, <clears throat> excuse me, the First Amendment. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Key case here is Carson versus Macon. And this involves the issue of whether or not Maine's program for providing tuition assistance to parents who live in school districts that don't have secondary schools, and there are a lot of those in Maine, is unconstitutional because parents can't use this tuition assistance to send their kids to religiously based schools. All right. Now, the question is why Maine is doing that. Maine is worried about violating its own constitutional provision, which says that you can't provide aid to religion. So Maine is also worried about the establishment clause. If Maine provides aid to a religiously based institution, then it violates the establishment clause. Okay. So is that constitutional? Well, the argument, I guess, is, and the argument that the court accepts, is that prohibiting aid to sectarian schools when aid to non-sectarian schools is legitimate, violates the constitution because it discriminates against the sectarian schools. All right, so keep in mind this non-discrimination principle. So here the real problem is, and the tension in the establishment clause and free exercise clauses is that if a state provides benefits for a religious organization, then the concern is that it violates the Establishment Clause. But if it doesn't, then it may violate the Free Exercise Clause. So there's tension between those two constitutional provisions. Now, the court has said that there's room for play in the joints sufficient to accommodate both clauses. But with the anti-discrimination principle that the court is adopting, 
there's not much room for play in the joints anymore. And what we can draw from the Trinity Lutheran case in 2017, and from the Supreme Court's opinion in the Espinoza case in 2020, is that if a state provides a benefit, it can't discriminate on the basis of religion. So the Espinoza case involves these scholarships. Scholarships can't be denied to sectarian schools if they're provided to non-sectarian schools. Now, nothing would require Montana to provide those uh, scholarships, but if they do, they can provide them on a discriminatory basis. And the same thing with the Trinity Lutheran case, which seems to be at the outset, just a case about rubber playground pellets. You want those on playgrounds so the kids don't get hurt as much, right? But if Missouri has a program offering grants to qualify nonprofits, they cannot exclude sectarian schools. Okay, for non-sectarian schools. If they can't discriminate is the key point. Okay, now that's what's involved in Carson versus Macon. So the court says it's really an unremarkable principle. Here, Maine's effectively penalizing the free exercise of religion by religiously based schools solely because of their religious character. That triggers strict scrutiny. All right. Well, court says that a law singling out religious conduct for distinctive treatment will, will rarely survive strict scrutiny. And it certainly doesn't in this particular case. Certainly, the state's got an interest in separation of church and state, but it's not a compelling interest in the face of the infringement of free exercise. All right, so what do you think happens if Maine provides a benefit to private schools um, that has to provide the benefit to religious schools? Failure to do so is discrimination. It's an anti, very powerful in free exercise cases, an anti-discrimination principle. So what's next? Well, of course, Justice Sotomayor says, I saw this coming in Trinity Lutheran. She dissented. She said this case is about more than playground pellets. Well, it was, as it turns out. It's now a well-established anti-discrimination principle. Okay, last case that I'll talk about is the Kennedy case. All right, now this is Coach Kennedy in the middle of the field after a football game. And looks like there's a player from an opposing team there, but they're gathered around him. Now he's taken a knee and, and who knows why. We'll get into that in a moment. All right, so this is the Kennedy case. He's a football coach and he gets disciplined for praying after games at the 50-yard line after being repeatedly warned not to do so. Okay, now the issue is whether or not this violates his right to free exercise of religion. Okay, lower courts thought, no problem here, right? Um, it's free exercise rights aren't violated. Plus this also constitutes government speech. He's in the course and scope of his employment here. And under those circumstances, government can regulate, all right? And so of course this flows from Garcetti versus Sebelius. All right, does it violate his right to free exercise? So he's got to prove that the uh, school district burdened his sincerely held religious beliefs. Well, does he have to pray midfield in a public high school after a football game? Aren't there other alternatives? Well, he doesn't have to choose the other alternatives. So the court says that school district is punishing him for engaging in a brief, quiet, personal observance, religious observance. All right. Now, who knows what he was doing? When it comes to the free speech claim also, um, court decides that this is not government speech. But let me go back for a second. So let's see, a brief, quiet, personal religious observance. Really? Okay. Now, another issue is whether or not he's being discriminated against based upon religion. It could be that he's uh, entitled to make a private phone call to his wife. Other people might be able to order pizza. And so perhaps that's what he's doing. He's taking a knee and he's calling his wife and then he's ordering pizza. So what do you think? 
I, I think this probably looks quite a bit like prayer. Well, if that other speech is allowed, then the religious speech can't be shut down because that constitutes discrimination. And therefore it's a violation of the free exercise clause. Plus the court says, this is not government speech. He's acting outside the scope of his official responsibilities and therefore government speech, the government speech doctrine does not apply so as to allow the government to regulate that speech. Interesting case. So what do you think? I wonder. Should prayer be allowed in public schools now? Maybe during the school day. Of course, you could allow the kids who feel uncomfortable about that to leave. And I guess you probably would have to do that to comply with West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. Um, but why not prayer in public schools? What about prayer at school ceremonies, graduation ceremonies, maybe to begin football games or basketball climb, uh, games? What's wrong with allowing prayer? Other sorts of observances are allowed. School fight song, why not onward Christian soldiers? We'll see. First Amendment speech is the last thing I'll talk about. This is the Boston City Hall, and this has often been called uh, the ugliest building in America. And it does sort of look like, um, I was thinking what it, what, it, what it would look like if a uh, four-year-old put a Lego set together in the dark. I mean, it really is an ugly building. <clears throat> okay, now the question is whether or not Boston, and you can see the, free, the, the uh, three flag poles here. There's a US flag, Commonwealth flag, and then there's a third pole where all sorts of other flags are flown, but not the camp constitution flag, because once again, city of Boston is concerned about violating the establishment clause if they allow a flag with a cross to be flown on the third flagpole. All right, well, once again, the anti-discrimination principle, and this is from a free, uh, free speech standpoint, you can't discriminate based upon viewpoints. And city of Boston is allowed all sorts of other flags to be flown. And that means that they can't deny the right of this particular group to fly its Christian flag under the circumstances. And then the remaining issue is whether or not this constitutes government speech. And Justice Alito really rankles some of the justices by establishing a list of factors to look at, deciding whether or not there's government speech. Not a hard and fast standard. And of course, Justice Breyer is a great pragmatist on the court. He prefers not bright line rules, but balancing appropriate considerations. And doing so, he decides that this does not constitute government speech. All right, so I'll stop here and turn this over to my colleague, Professor Conar Steenberg. Thanks, Mike. Uh, give me a second here to share some slides. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change gears just a little bit. Uh, Mike was focused mainly on um, cases that maybe, you know, in our in our uh, law schools dialectic are in the con law liberties side of the curriculum. I'm gonna focus on some questions that are on the con law powers side of the the uh, the curriculum. Um, and for my money, I include in the notion of con law powers. Uh, a lot of issues that arise in the context of another curricular choice, which is, of course, called administrative law. And this first case that I'm going to talk about spans administrative law and questions of constitutional powers, in particular questions of separation of powers uh, involving the role of the judiciary uh, and the executive in interpreting uh, the intent of Congress. So um, this is an important case, a really important case, uh, and the big picture issues I will talk about in just a second, but, but to set those up, unfortunately, we're gonna have to start in the weeds uh, a little bit. And the weeds we're gonna have to start in are in the weeds of a very weedy statute indeed, which is the Clean Air Act. This is a really complicated environmental statute. In this particular case, um, we're, we're worried about the interpretation of this highlighted clause here in, in section 111, uh, 111B, um, governing uh, the, the pollution, the air pollution performance of new, uh, new stationary sources of air pollution. And the phrase that's used there, best system of emission reduction, is really going to be at the heart of the interpretive issues in this, in this case. Um, under the Clean Air Act, um, these, these stationary sources, new ones, as well as some existing ones, 
are supposed to implement and use the best system of emissions reduction, and it's EPA's job to explain what that, what that is. And commonly, that means um, things like um, uh, installing scrubbers on the smokestacks to take out particular you know, kinds of pollutants, or changing a production process to get to a higher efficiency of combustion so there's less particulate matter going in the air. Those kinds of mechanical uh, technological interventions are typically what EPA has required under this obligation to implement the best system of emissions reduction. Well, the Obama administration's EPA took a, a little bit of different of an approach here and said that when it comes to figuring out what the best system of emissions reduction is for the electric power generation industry, we don't think it's a new machine or a new combustion process or anything technological like that. We think the best system of emissions reduction is just to get away from burning fossil fuels, in particular coal, and to start using renewables instead. And the, the underlying notion here is something called generation shifting, shifting the generation of power from, from, from coal and other carbon uh, heavy uh, uh, fuel sources towards natural, uh, I'm sorry, towards renewables. Okay. So the, the Clean Power Plan, which is this regulatory plan uh, set forth by the EPA during the Obama administration, takes the position that the, the BSER, the best system of emissions reduction for electric generation, the electric energy generation industry, is to get away from coal and start using renewables. All right. So the interpretive question is, what does the statute really mean? What does the statute mean when it talks about the best system of emissions reduction? A lawsuit is brought challenging the clean power plan on the theory that it's not authorized by the statute, that when the statute talks about best system, it means in the, in the mind of the challengers, and that later includes the Trump administration, system means technology. It means mechanical devices. It means combustion processes. It doesn't mean, as the Obama era EPA believes it means, other kinds of systems, like a system of regulation, as opposed to a electronic or other mechanical system. The, the, the Obama era EPA says we think system is broad enough to embrace systems of regulation, like our clean power plan. All right, so it's a contest, contested interpretation as to what system means. And a lawsuit is brought challenging the clean power plan and before we can get to the, to the merits issue here, we're gonna encounter an, a question of justiciability. So here's the timeline. 2015, the Obama administration adopts this clean power plan with this interpretation of what system means. Uh, in 2016, that plan is challenged and the Supreme Court in a, in a fairly unprecedented case stays the implementation of the clean power plan before it can even actually go into effect. Uh, famously, there's an election in 2016, you may recall that, there's a change of administration, and the Trump administration uh, decides that the, we're going to repeal the Clean Power Plan and replace it with a different plan called the Affordable Clean Energy Plan, okay? On the very last day of, uh, uh, second to last day of the, of the Trump administration, January 19th, um, there is a there's a decision from the from the DC circuit in a in a lawsuit challenging the Trump plan. Stay with me here, people. I told you we we're going to go in the weeds. So th there's a there's a challenge to the Trump plan, and ultimately what happens is the DC circuit says Trump plan that is stayed because that wasn't done properly. The, you followed the wrong procedure. Uh, clean power plan from the Obama administration that remains stayed because the Supreme Court said so. Upshot, there is no plan. There, there, there's neither an Obama-style plan nor a Trump-style plan. There's just no plan with respect to uh, the question of regulating uh, what, what the best system of emissions reduction would be for the electric power industry. There's nothing. Okay. Next day, President Biden is sworn in. Uh, and February uh, 2021, the EPA under President Biden announces we are giving up on the clean, clean power plan. Uh, it's, a, it's a dead letter. We, we, we will not enforce the clean power plan. In fact, we're gonna adopt our own brand new rule. And so one question here is, is there anything left to litigate? If the original challenge was to the clean power plan, and if the Obama administration now has said, we, we give up on the clean power plan, we're gonna do something else. Is there a case in controversy anymore? Is there, is there jurisdiction under under Article 3. Remember, Article 3, Section 2, talks about cases and controversies, right? 
uh, that the, the scope of the federal uh, judicial power extends only to cases and controversies. And in the particular context of this dispute, there's a question about whether the case isn't moot at this point, right? The, the underlying uh, regulatory measure that was the focus of the lawsuit uh, by a number of states and so forth has now been not only stayed, but the administration has said, we, we're giving up on it, we're, we're, we're backing off of it. And so is there anything left to litigate anymore? Well, there's a rule in, 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 the, in the realm of, of mootness doctrine, which speaks to what happens when the mootness arises as a result of the defendant's own voluntary sort of cessation of whatever the offending conduct was. And that rule is, um, is pretty strict. It says, uh, we're not gonna treat that kind of scenario as mooting a case, unless it's absolutely clear that the wrongful behavior isn't gonna recur. And based on that rule, the majority here says, we understand the, the Biden administration has said they're not gonna enforce the Clean Power Plan anymore. We get that they say they're gonna adopt their own rule. But the underlying question of whether uh, even the new rule might not interpret best system of em emissions reduction as meaning something more than just a, a piece of machinery, whether it might mean a regulatory system, they haven't given up on that. The, the administration has never, has never said we give up on that particular interpretation. And therefore, the new rule might look just like the old rule, says just Chief Justice Roberts. And for that reason, this case is not moot. Uh, in the dissent, Justice Kagan says that's probably right as a, as a technical matter, but it's also true that the Supreme Court entirely controls its docket, right? Uh, mootness is not the only thing that determines whether or not a particular case appears before the Supreme Court or persists when it gets before the Supreme Court. There are lots of other doctrines that this court can apply from the discretion to grant certiorari or not, all the way to doctrines like ripeness. Maybe this, is, this isn't ripe until we get to see what the new Biden rule looks like. Uh, Justice Kagan, who with Justice Breyer's departure probably becomes the leading voice on regulatory and administrative law matters on the court. Justice Kagan says, there's no reason for us to decide this case now. Let's wait and see what the Biden administration comes up with. Well, she's in dissent. So the majority is gonna decide this case now. All right, back to the interpretive issue after that digression into article three uh, mootness and standing. So we're back to the interpretive issue. What does the best system of emissions reduction mean? The meta issue here is whether the court should defer to the agency's interpretation of the law. Those of you who've studied administrative law will be familiar with something called the Chevron Doctrine. Those of you who haven't, here's a quick lesson in the Chevron Doctrine. The Chevron Doctrine is this longstanding principle going all the way back at least to 1984 uh, that, that, that says that when we have an ambiguous statute, maybe you could read it this way, maybe you could read it that way. How do we interpret that statute? The Chevron Doctrine says that federal courts will defer to an agency's interpretation of the statute, so long as the agency's interpretation of the statute is reasonable, that it's not, you know, it's not from outer space. It's a reasonable interpretation of the statute that, that the, the words of the statute will bear that interpretation. So it's a choice. It's a choice by the federal courts to effectively say, when it comes to interpreting statutes, we should be taking our cues and deferring to the agencies that Congress has charged with the administration of, of these statutes. So there's all kinds of separation of powers notions in there. And what the Chevron doctrine reflects is at least that Supreme Court's judgment that when Congress adopts a law that requires interpretation and it's, it's a regulatory measure and there's a regulatory agency, Congress intends for that agency to have the kind of the say in what those interpretive, uh, how those interpretive issues should be decided. And the court's role is just to determine whether those interpretations are reasonable, consistent with the statute, not to second guess those kinds of interpretations. All right, that's a bedrock principle of American, of US administrative law. And if we apply that here, the argument would be, well, EPA has interpreted system to mean not just pieces of machinery, but also regulatory systems. Therefore, uh, we should defer to that particular interpretation by the agency. And that's of course, not at all what the Supreme Court does here. Interestingly, the Supreme Court never even cites Chevron in this opinion, even though Chevron is the most cited case in the United States reports by, by the estimate of one scholar who had way too much time on their hands doing some empirical research. Uh, 
Chevron is the most cited case, even more so than say Marbury versus Madison or Brown versus Board. Chevron is the most cited case in our jurisprudence. Doesn't get cited here. All that gets cited is a law review article entitled Controlling Chevron-Based Delegations, which kind of tells you something about where this court is coming from. This is a court that's reeling Chevron back in and saying, maybe we don't defer quite so much. And the, the device by which the court achieves that result is the, the announcement of something called the major questions doctrine. What, what Chief Justice Roberts says is that there are extraordinary cases where the nature of the issues at stake, uh, their economic and political significance, their big dealness means that it doesn't make sense for us as a court to think that Congress wanted agencies to decide those interpretive questions. Instead, it makes sense for us to think that Congress wanted us, the court, to decide those interpretive questions. At a minimum, if Congress wants to defer big deal questions in their interpretation to administrative agencies, we would expect Congress to be very clear about that kind of delegation of authority. We're not just simply going to assume it in the way that Chevron said that we would in the past. So where does this come from? Uh, Chief Justice Roberts says this is nothing new. We've been doing this for a while. Points to a number of cases where uh, the Supreme Court, in essence, overrode uh, an agency decision, uh, an agency interpretation of an ambiguous statute. Brown and Williamson, where the FDA uh, tried to assert authority over uh, cigarettes, uh, the court said there, we don't think that the federal, uh, uh, the Food and Drug Act gives you that authority. Oregon versus Gonzalez, where uh, the Attorney General, uh, US Attorney General tried to exercise authority under the um, Controlled Substances Act to uh, rescind physicians' licenses if they, if they wrote prescriptions for, uh, for, for drugs used in assisted suicide. Uh, the court again says, we don't think Congress meant for the agency, in this case, the Department of Justice, to have the interpretive power to read its authority that way. And then maybe most on point, Utility Air Regulatory Group, another Clean Air Act case. EPA is authority to regulate air pollutants, which is an authority granted by statute, uh, does not include the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from small sources like hotels, office buildings, and so forth. Um, and the way, that, the way that the Chief Justice characterizes these cases is to say each of these cases certainly involved some kind of interpretive issue. So it might've felt like a Chevron style case, but in each of these cases, he says, common sense as to the manner in which Congress would have been likely to delegate that interpretive power made it unlikely Congress had actually done so. In other words, each of these cases dealt with such a big deal, whether it was because it's a big deal politically or a big deal economically. So for example, you know, EPA's power to regulate hotels, office buildings, and hospitals in their emissions, such a big deal. We just don't think Congress would have left those interpretive questions to the agencies without some clear statement that it meant to do that. And we think this is another one of those big deal cases. Here, EPA is claiming a previously kind of unheralded, kind of novel uh, reading of what best system of emissions uh, 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 regulation looks like. Um, and that particular interpretation is a capital B, capital D big deal, says the majority. Um, the consequential, the, the basic and consequential trade offs involved in whether to, to regulate the entire industry, the entire electric power industry in this way by generation shifting, by moving from fossil fuels to renewables, that's a big deal. And we don't think Congress would have left it to an agency to get to that regulatory result in this, in this kind of uh, interpretive device, right? And by using this interpretive device, uh, interpreting a statute this way. Uh, therefore, Chevron deference implicitly, remember the court never mentions Chevron, but Chevron deference implicitly is inappropriate. We need a clear statement from Congress, and we don't have that here. Justice Kagan, writing for the dissent, says this, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. Um, we are disrupting the pattern of, of uh, a separation of powers that has been established with respect to the regulatory state for a very long time. She says Congress knows what it doesn't. <laughs> And, it, and what it can't know whenever it writes a statute. And therefore Congress gives the expert agency the power to address those, those, those kinds of interpretive issues that gap filling authority. 
that today the majority in the court overrides Congress's legislative choice. So from her perspective, uh, this is the judicial branch engaging in overreach, uh, overreach with respect to what Congress intended in these kinds of cases. She says those previous cases where you claim that we've, we've been using this major questions doctrine, no. Each of those cases was simply an example where the agency in question was, was trying to extend an interpretation of the statute that the statutory language just wouldn't bear. Remember under Chevron, it's not every agency interpretation that the courts defer to, it's only the reasonable ones, the ones that are born by the language in the statute that have some, some support in the language of the statute. And she says each of those cases is a case where uh, the agency's interpretation, the, the statutory language just didn't bear the interpretation the agency was giving. Obviously a disagreement about what those, those cases meant, but now we have something called the major questions doctrine. So that from now on, when we have a regulatory measure uh, that is based on the interpretation of some ambiguous statute, instead of deferring to the agency's reasonable uh, interpretation of that statute, we have to pause and first ask, is this a big deal? It's a big enough deal that the court should retake responsibility for interpreting the statute from the agency. Um, interestingly, uh, Justice Kagan says, by the way, where's the big deal in this case? The Clean Power Plan, it was stayed. There was no clean Clean Power Plan even in effect when we got to litigating this and deciding this particular case. How could it have been a big deal? And moreover, even during the time when it was stayed, the uh, industry engaged in generation shifting anyway, even without the regulatory framework, the, gen this, the uh, industry itself started moving from fossil fuels in the direction of renewables uh, in a way that actually exceeded the goals of the clean power plan. So what exactly is the big disputed economic political issue here if the if the industry is already doing it of its own accord anyway? And and interestingly, the Trump administration uh, federal register notice when it when it sought to to uh, uh, enunciate its own plan um, said there's likely to be no difference between a world where the clean power plan was implemented and one where there where it was not. Again, where is the big deal, says Justice Kagan. All right, let's move on to the next case here in the time we have, and I wanna leave time for questions. Let's talk about this case and then we'll go to questions. I'll, we'll skip the third case for now. If folks are interested in talking about that, we can. But um, you may remember last year in the McGirt case, uh, the Supreme Court decided that a good chunk of Oklahoma actually turns out still to be uh, Indian reservation. That, uh, that under uh, the principles that, that of, of the acknowledgement of reservations and the sort of the disestablishment of, of reservations, we didn't have, uh, as, as folks may have thought, we, we didn't have a situation where a bunch of these reservations had ever really been disestablished. And all that green area kind of on the right side of the slide turns out to still be uh, what in the, in the parlance of federal, uh, uh, federal law is still called Indian country, okay? Um, and that includes the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is still located in the, in the realm of what is known as Indian country. Big case, uh, McGirt last year, written by Justice Gorsuch. So in this case, this is a follow-on case to McGirt. And it's a question about the jurisdiction of the state and the jurisdiction of the federal government in Indian country, in this case, in Tulsa. Uh, Castro Huerta is a, is a non-Indian. He's convicted by a state court of criminal child neglect of his stepdaughter, who is an Indian, a Cherokee Indian. And these, these incidents occur in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2015. In 2020, we get the McGirt case saying, actually, it turns out Tulsa is still located in Indian country. So C Castro Huerta then comes back to the court and says, I think my prosecution was invalid. I think the state lacked the jurisdiction to prosecute this crime because it incurred in Indian country. I think that only the federal government has jurisdiction there. He argues the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction to prosecute crimes against Indians occurring in Indian country. And therefore he says, my state conviction should be vacated. And he rests that argument on a couple of things. First of all, on some case law, uh, Worcester versus Virginia, 1832. He also rests it on preemption. And we'll talk about both of the sources of law here, both of these arguments in a little more detail. Let's talk about the first argument, the Worcester holding. So way back in 1832, uh, Chief Justice Marshall says in a, in, a, in a dispute involving the state of Georgia and the Cherokee Indian Nation, 
He says the Cherokee Nation is a distinct community occupying its own territory, excuse me, with, with boundaries accurately described in which the laws of Georgia can have no force, in which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter. And uh, Castro Huerta seizes upon that language in which the laws of Georgia can have no force to make this argument. This stands, he says, this stands for the proposition that states' laws have no force in Indian country. Only the federal government has jurisdiction over, over crimes in, in Indian country. That's, that's his argument here. Well, the majority rejects this and rejects it on the basis of a couple of intervening cases, McBratney and Draper. And I've done some creative uh, highlighting here. I don't know how many of you, maybe in your first year law school, bought like 12 different colors of highlighters. And like, I'm gonna highlight the facts in blue. I'm gonna highlight the issue in pink and so forth. Well, you know, some of us still do that kind of thing, even this many years on. So here's what I've done. Uh, I've highlighted in green the way the majority understands the McBratney and Draper cases. Uh, in green, the, 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 the majority says these are cases in which the Supreme Court said that states retain jurisdiction over crimes in Indian country. Conveniently, maybe leaving out the yellow part, which is the part that, that, uh, that Castro Huerta would point to and say, well, those cases really involved a very narrow category of crimes occurring in Indian country, namely crimes committed by non-Indians against non-Indians. So to the extent that McBratney and Draper mean anything, they're just, from, from Castro Huerta's perspective, they're just minor exceptions to the general Wooster rule. That's not the way the majority reads it. The majority says these cases uh, tell us that Worcester was an overstatement, that in fact, the states do retain jurisdiction over crimes in Indian country, and that the narrower reading uh, of uh, uh, the, 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 that this ends up being a narrower reading of Worcester than, than, the, than Castro Huerta would, would prefer. That's the, that's the way it goes, says the majority. A second argument that Castro Huerta makes is on preemption grounds. He cites a couple of statutes to make this argument. The first is the General Crimes Act, 1984, which has this curious language, the general laws of the United States as to the punishment of offenses committed in any place within the sole and executive jurisdiction of the United States shall extend to Indian country. His argument is, well, that means the sole and exclusive jurisdiction of the United States shall extend to Indian country. This is Congress affirming the idea that only the federal government has jurisdiction in Indian country. The majority says, no, you're, you're not reading that correctly. All this law is saying is, as to those kinds of uh, places over which the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction, places like US military bases, places like national parks, we all understand that those are places where the U.S. government has has exclusive federal has exclusive criminal jurisdiction. Well, if any of those kinds of places happens to be in an Indian reservation, the federal government still has exclusive jurisdiction over that military base located on the Indian reservation, or over that national park located in the Indian reservation. Um, you will see that the dissent thinks that that's that's a little bit um, disingenuous a reading of this statute, but. This statute as a grounds of preemption is going to get rejected. The other, the other law that Castro Huerta cites for his preemption argument is Public Law 280. Public Law 280 is really interesting because Congress in Public Law 280 says, we hereby grant to five states, and I can't remember which five states they are, but five states, and they're named in the, in the law, we hereby grant these five states the broad jurisdiction to prosecute state law offenses by or against Indians in Indian country. And Castro Huerta says, well, that's really interesting. If Congress thought it was necessary to pass a law granting these states jurisdiction in Indian country, that must mean that absent that kind of act, states don't have jurisdiction in Indian country. Otherwise, why would you need the statute? Right? Why would you need public law 280 if these states could already exercise jurisdiction? It, the statute would be pointless surplusage, says Castro Huerta. Well, the court says, no, no, public law 280 is just a clarification of what we already know from McBratney and Draper, that federal, uh, that state jurisdiction extends beyond crimes by non-Indians against non-Indians to include crimes by or against Indians. And the fact that Congress saw fit to clarify that in a, in a statute cannot reasonably be characterized as unnecessary surplusage. So we're going to reject 
this preemption argument as well. The dissent, and here's a combination that uh, you will never see again, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan in dissent. Oh, you'll never see it again literally because Justice Breyer is no longer on the court, but I, it's gonna be, it's tough for me to imagine when we might see this combination again. Justice Gorsuch who wrote McGirt, which is the opinion that said most of Oklahoma is still an Indian reservation, it's still Indian country rather. Justice Gorsuch says this is, this is a, basically a betrayal of McGirt and what we said there. Where the court once stood firm today at Wilts, um, tribes are not private organizations within state boundaries. Their reservations are not glorified campground, private campgrounds. Tribes are sovereigns. He says one can only hope the political branches and future courts will do their duty to honor this nation's promises, even as we have failed today to do our own. So pretty scathing language from Justice Gorsuch. He obviously disagrees with the way the court is reading the effect of McGrat uh, McGratney and Draper on that, that Worcester case. Uh, he thinks that Castro Huerta's preemption arguments make a lot of sense, in particular, the public law 280 argument that if Congress saw fit to, to specifically authorize state jurisdiction in, in Indian country, that must by definition mean that that jurisdiction is lacking until Congress grants it. Otherwise, why did they adopt public law 280? And he says the majority just fails to answer, answer that argument in a, in a convincing way. Uh, one more observation here. Uh, Justice Gorsuch points out that Oklahoma itself had more or less conceded these points in past legal positions. In the McGirt briefing, Oklahoma said, please don't rule in favor of the tribes in, in, the, in the McGirt case, because if you do, we'll end up lacking jurisdiction over crimes committed by Indians in Indian country. That was Oklahoma's argument for why uh, the McGirt case should not have been decided the way it was. And in 1991, even going back that far, uh, an, an attorney general opinion from the, from the Oklahoma attorney general talked about the exclusive uh, federal jurisdiction in, in Indian country with respect to crimes committed by or against Indians. So Justice uh, Gorsuch says here that the state has changed its tune uh, in an opportunistic way in this case. All right. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to talk about the Torres case. I think instead we should go to go to questions because I suspect there may be a number of questions. I want to make sure we have time to get to those. We've already gone over time a little bit. But Devin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, if you got some questions for us. Yeah, it looks like we have one hand up. Uh, you want to feel free to come off mute. Go for it. Thanks. Um, so I guess this is directed at both Professor Stinson, if he's uh, still here and uh, Professor MKS. Uh, so what I did a project in my common liberties course last year on Bremerton uh, uh, school district and that, that's the Kennedy case. And the remarkable thing about that case, I think is what Breyer pointed out about, Justice Breyer pointed out that it seems like the facts were not clear at all and the Supreme Court didn't seem to care. Um, and I wonder if, if there's, you could speak to that and or if there are any other examples of a case where the facts were so, the, the facts were not clear at all and the Supreme Court didn't seem to care about it. Because I think if, um, if the facts were more fleshed out below, then perhaps the decision might've gone differently, which is another thing that I think Justice Breyer said um, in the ultimate, I think, I mean, if he concurred or dissented, I think he probably, I think he dissented from the, from the case itself. So just wanted to, to pose that question about the Supreme Court seeming to elide the fact issues as non-consequential. Mike, you want to take a swing at that one? I think you're right um, that the facts weren't as clear as the uh, Supreme Court indicated. That's why I put that picture up. <clears throat> it seems to be, I mean, the reality seems to be quite different from the facts that the court discussed. I mean, it pretty clearly was praying at the 50 yard line. You know, as I say, it wasn't uh, ordering pizza, talking to his wife or doing anything other than praying, right? He's taking a knee to pray at the 50 yard line. Um, and the court just seems to brush that aside. <clears throat> now, goodness, um, I'm trying to think of there are equivalent cases or other cases where the Supreme Court has done 
just exactly that. There's been some significant factual dispute, and the court seemed to uh, seemed to brush it aside. But I don't know. I guess I can't put my finger on it. On it. Like I'm. I'm remembering, I can't remember the case, but I'm remembering a dissent by Justice Sotomayor, which starts with a line, something like, the court makes a very reasonable decision about a case uh, uh, and tells a very reasonable story about a case that isn't even before us. Here's what really happened. And I, I can't remember what case that was, but it suggests to me that maybe this is not an isolated phenomenon, Lewis, that perhaps there are other situations where the majority and the dissent have disagreements, not just obviously about the doctrine, but about the underlying factual predicate for, for sort of enunciating that doctrine. Um, but I agree with Professor Steenson that certainly this is one of those cases, that the that the, the, the dissent's view of what actually happened in this case departs uh, significantly uh, and substantially from, from the majority's view. Even such things as in the, in the majority's view in, in, in the Bremerton case, Justice Gorsuch talks about how at a certain point, the school responds by um, banning people from entering the field and by calling in the police department to make sure nobody goes out there. And what he doesn't say is that that, was, that happened after there was basically what in, in the soccer universe we'd call a pitch invasion, that basically uh, at one of these 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 uh, uh, football games where, where where Coach Kennedy went out to pray at the 50 yard line, the media had been alerted about that. It was a big deal, and members of the press and and people in the stands basically stormed the field to join uh, Coach Kennedy out on the field, knocking over members of the band. Uh, says the dissent. None of those facts really end up in the majority opinion to explain why the school district decided to have police present at the next football game. So even those kinds of things, Lewis, um, you're right. They, there's a real difference between how the, the dissent and the majority present the facts here. Um, and you can make your own judgments about, about why that might be and whether that, that's, that's legitimate or not. Other questions? Got one in the chat here. Um... Does the court take this liberty on facts because the facts were actually proven or the facts that or are the facts there and overlooked? Well, I mean, there's a there's a record in these cases, right? I mean, this is this is not uh, being litigated in the first instance before the Supreme Court. It's getting litigated in a district court, it's then getting appealed to the to an appellate court, the Ninth Circuit, and finally showing up at the Supreme Court. So presumably, there's something we can point to here as the record. Um, so maybe the issue here is, is one of selective emphasis, um, that certain facts are highlighted and other facts are, are, are not discussed at the same sort of volume level, and, and that that may be the, the, where the, the, the disagreement or the, the differences are arising. What do you, what do you think, Mike? Well, I think as one of the uh, Supreme Court justices has said, let me write the facts and anybody can write the rest of the opinion. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. So depending on how the facts are written, how the facts are shaded, or how the facts are emphasized is going to uh, drive the remainder of the, uh, of the legal analysis. That, that's interesting because there's a, there's a corollary from uh, Senator Orrin Hatch when he was in, in the Senate, he said, let me write the procedure, you can write the substance and I will insert expletive you every time. So, so, so a similar kind of notion with respect to procedure versus substance. Haley. Yeah, this question was for Professor Steenson. Um, do you think in the 303 creative case that they're likely to adopt or go with the same factors um, in deciding that like the history of expression and government control, he mentioned a case, I didn't catch the name where there were some, some guiding factors. Do you think the court will stick with those or choose to go a different direction? Well, it, <clears throat> excuse me, let me start. Are, are all of you familiar with the Masterpiece Cake Shop case? Generally familiar. Um, well, keep in mind that in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the court did not reach the free speech question. Justice Thomas did, but not a majority of the court. And the court decided in that case that there was hostility exhibited toward religion on the basis of the Colorado or by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. 
And that's because actually in an open meeting, some of the uh, members of the commission, not uh, rebutted by any other members of the commission, indicated some hostility saying things, for example, like if you wanna do business in Colorado, then you're gonna have to adhere to the Civil Rights Act. So hostility toward religion plus other bakers or another baker in specific uh, was not treated exactly the same. Once again, the anti-discrimination principle comes in, but it's quite clear that if government indicates hostility toward religion and hostility applies anytime there's differential treatment, we of course see that in the Fulton case, Fulton versus city of uh, Philadelphia from two terms ago. So the anti-discrimination principle is very powerful. If there's discrimination that constitutes hostility for purposes of the application of the uh, free exercise clause. But keep in mind that the court did not reach the question of freedom of expression. And so will the court engage in a detailed historical analysis? Hell yes, of course they will. Um, uh, it's, it's Justice Thomas dug into the history of cake design. And I don't know if you bake cakes or feel creative juices flowing when you bake a cake. I mean, the few times that I've done it, we just throw whatever's in the box in a bowl, mix it up, put it in the oven and hope for the best. Um, creativity, not much. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, most of us are not Jack Phillips. Some people work in marble, some in wood. He worked in cake batter and cake decorations. So the court did go into the history in that case of cake decoration. Now, in this situation, what we're dealing with in Plana's case is um, a website. So the question is whether or not doing a website for people uh, who are getting married um, is necessarily creative. And I think there's a pretty good argument that it is. There's a parallel eight circuit case. And if you made chocolate chip cookies, you have to share them. Yeah. Where are they? <laughs> So if, uh, if somebody engages in the Eighth Circuit case involves wedding videos, a uh, company in uh, St. Cloud that wanted to produce wedding videos but didn't want to provide those videos for same-sex couples, the Eighth Circuit said that, that constituted, in line with Justice Thomas's opinion in uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop, that that constituted viewpoint-based discrimination. All right, so then that violates the free exercise, not the free exercise clause, the free speech clause. You can't have viewpoint-based discrimination. Interestingly enough, that opinion was written by uh, Judge Strauss, who was a clerk for Judge Thomas, formerly on the Supreme Court, then in the Eighth Circuit. Um, so I think the court's gonna end up confronting quite directly the issue that it didn't have to confront because there were factual differences in the case, enough factual differences in the record. And I guess maybe that's another example of the, of the uh, case that uh, Lewis uh, was talking about. Um, and that's also a case, by the way, where there was some dispute about how the facts ought to be bred. But there were really questions about whether or not the Colorado Civil Rights Commission really did discriminate. Some of the justices thought yes, and, and the dissenting justices thought what? Are we looking at the same record? Um, so it's yet one more example of courts being selective and looking at the facts, but courts really gonna be forced in this case, or I shouldn't say forced, the court took this case on to resolve the unresolved question in Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop. Another issue is whether or not free exercise of religion is going to preclude the application of an otherwise neutral Civil Rights Act. And you're all familiar with Employment Division versus Smith, right? So what happens if Smith goes down the drain? <clears throat> well, then we're back to a, a strict scrutiny standard. If somebody's right to free exercise of religion is substantially burdened as it would be in these cases. So then strict scrutiny applies. So if it's not a neutral law that's generally applicable, then we're back to where we were with say Wisconsin versus Yoder um, Sherbert versus Werner, and strict scrutiny will apply if there's a substantial burden on the sincerely held religious uh, belief. 
So this case could be ripe for overruling Smith, which means that Alanis is going to have a pretty powerful um, argument that her right to free exercise of religion is substantially burdened. Government's got to show a compelling interest. Maybe there are other alternatives to having this Colorado civil rights law stuffed down her throat. So that's where we could end up going. In some ways, I think Bremerton sets this up a little bit as well, because of course in, in, in Bremerton school district, the football coach case, um, Justice Gorsuch talks about how free speech and free exercise work in tandem, right? He makes he makes that point that sometimes there's there's an overlap to them, and I think that that perspective probably informs where Justice Thomas was coming from in Masterpiece Cake Shop, and probably will recur in 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 this case as well. I would expect um, differences, of course, is we don't have the kind of establishment kinds of issues around coercion and stuff in 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 this case. Um, and also interesting about about Bremerton is. You know, given given the disappointment that many members of the court voiced about and and sort of dis, uh, dissatisfaction with Employment Division versus Smith, that that they voiced in the Fulton case, uh, in Bremerton they use Smith, right? In Bremerton, uh, Justice Gorsuch says we're going to use Smith to analyze the free exercise claim, and lo and behold, what the what the school district is doing here fails to be neutral and it fails to be generally applicable. Therefore, we go to strict scrutiny. So I guess that was a moment when they could have also uh, overruled Smith if they wanted to, but found it unnecessary to do that to, to dispose of the case, I guess. So how is this going to affect future common law courses? You're, <laughs> you're all going to have to come back for a refresher. We're going to keep track of you. You're going to have to come back. That's 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 easy. I'm just going to teach property from now on. I'm going to go back to forget about this. This this is fine. You, Mike can teach these courses. It's it's been interesting because um, you know this is I've said this to a number of people. This is probably the least of our concerns, at least of anyone's concerns. But substantial changes to con law syllabi have been necessary over the last couple of years, and I suspect that will continue to be true in the coming years. Uh, in the coming year, at least, I would expect some more changes to be made, both on the power side and on the liberty side. And like I say, you know, woe is us. Oh, we have to change our syllabi. But I mean, it, it, the, 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 the deeper concern here, I think, is the rate at which these changes are coming up. They don't seem to be happening in sort of an incremental kind of way anymore. They seem to be wholesale. Would you agree with that, Mike? The, the, the scale of the changes is different? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And, and uh, it's almost like blunt force trauma, except you will see justices, if you look very, very carefully, <clears throat> planting seeds. And those seeds sprout, they flower, they grow. A really good example is in, well, let's say Trinity Lutheran. That's the case involving rubber playground pellets. State of Missouri wants to provide to various institutions. They apply for grants. A religiously based school applied for the grant and was denied that uh, that grant for the pellets. And it was based upon a non discrimination principle. And footnote three in that case, Chief Justice Roberts said, after all, this is just a case about rubber playground pellets. Other justices said, no, we don't agree with that. This principle is much broader. The dissenting justice has said, wait and see. Mm -hmm. and so then five years later, where are we? We waited and we saw. Uh, now, yeah. yeah, it's really not a case about rubber playground pellets at all. It's a broad anti-discrimination principle. And so what we'll see is a, is a continuing uh, de-emphasis on the importance of the establishment clause. And if you couple the court's establishment clause cases with earlier decisions, Mitchell versus Helms, for example, I'm not sure that I see anything that prevents direct aid to uh, religiously based schools. Just write the damn check to them. Why not? Why do we go through this dance? Well, it's, uh, it's about 20 after. I unfortunately have to go. Uh, 
Uh, but I, I appreciate everybody being here and, and listening to us talk and posing these questions. That doesn't mean the rest of you can't continue, but I leave it up to Devin, our moderator, to decide uh, whether, whether the discussion will continue. But I, I'm grateful for your questions and the opportunity to present. Well, I'm happy to stick around if anybody else does. If you want to terminate, Devin, that's all right, too. But feel free to get a hold of us at any time. You know where we are. You don't know where we live, but you know where our offices are and, and uh, you know our emails. They might so, know where we live, Mike. They're pretty good at that kind of stuff now. <laughs> that's probably right. Well, thank you, Professor Conor Steenberg, uh, for joining. And if there are any uh, last questions for Professor Steenson, um, we can do that. Oh, we have one. Karen, go for it. Just one quick question um, following up on the having to change the syllabi for future courses. When we discuss these cases in the future, will they be, do you think, presented in a discussion about should they or should they have not been overturned and, and that kind of thing? Or, or is it going to be sort of presented, this is now the law? knowing that you don't have a whole lot of time to cover everything anyway, um, will there be discussion about this kind of thing? Or is it just now, here's here's what it is now? It depends, on, it, it depends entirely on who you have for constitutional law. When Dobbs was pending, I can tell you how I handled it uh, last year. And uh, students actually ended up reading the principal briefs in the case. and. This is actually a class decision. They ended up writing an opinion in the Dobbs case, but it's hard to write it on one side or the other. So they had four pages to write a majority opinion, and then they had four pages to write a dissenting opinion. So they had to consider both sides, and I thought that worked out really uh, quite well. But when you teach constitutional law, you really have to talk about the evolution of the doctrine, not just this is what the law is. But how did the law get there? Constitutional law is very much a history course. And uh, you can't escape it in part because of the court's emphasis on history and uh, traditions. Um, so as you well know, uh, in the common law course that you, that you just had to try to figure out what happens with substantive due process and why, you really have to start, well, if not before, at least with the Lochner era decisions and see what happens as you trace Lochner all the way through West Coast Hotel Company versus Parish and the demise of, uh, of Lochner and the development of other fundamental constitutional rights. You have to try to determine just exactly how the court's making those decisions. So how does substantive due process doctrine evolve? And you really have to do the same thing also in the cases involving equal protection. Same thing in the First Amendment area. And of course, constitutional liberties is what? It's half substantive due process and equal protection and half the First Amendment. Most of that focuses on speech. The last, uh, the last couple of weeks, you end up getting into the religion clauses, right? So you really have to get into the evolution of the law. I, I, I don't think you can teach common law by just simply um, telling students what the law is. You have to figure out how it got there. Um, and then you have to determine whether or not the decisions are legitimate. There are different theories of constitutional interpretation. Um, and sometimes they're set out fairly starkly. We have originalism, which is really now, as you've seen from the discussion tonight, primary theory of constitutional interpretation combination of textualism and originalism, or original meaning. Originalism has lots of, uh, lots of different meanings, but you also have an interpretation which emphasizes the living constitution. But if you do that, then where's the anchor? Um, that's the issue that Justice Thomas raises. You have to talk about all of those things in constitutional law. You know, and you're certainly right, Justice uh, Scalia probably is, uh, is uh, smiling about this. Um, there's a question about Brackeen, how uh, I fear for the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and of course, in the oral arguments, there are questions about why um, the best interests of the child should not be considered. And there's a huge amount at stake 
Um, and not the least of which is a, is a factor concerning um, the decimation of indigenous persons and their culture. How else can it be kept alive if, if, if we don't have something like the Indian Child Welfare Act? So I don't know what's gonna happen. But you know, from the standpoint of the students, what do you think is important in constitutional law? And we turn the question around, what would you like to know? So Scott, John, you, you don't have to answer my question. Well, I, I was gonna ask, so there was an order out of a case in, in the Southern District of Mississippi about a firearms case um, about whether felons can possess firearms um, if that passes constitutional muster after, after Bruin. And the order in the case, um, the judge is asking the parties to brief her on whether the court now needs to appoint a historian to to review not just case law, which is which you know a judge would be able to do, but now we have to go and and review who knows how many years of of history and what books have been written to determine whether what's the proper determination in the case is that. Is that the future that the courts could be looking at in many of these constitutional cases? Well, I don't know if the courts are necessarily going to employ historians, but imagine, imagine, for example, and I've thought about this, let's say you work in a county attorney's office, uh, or you are the county attorney, and um, county board wants to adopt firearms regulations. Um, so what do you need to do? You need to find a historical analog, right? So you need to do historical research. Well. Most lawyers aren't historians and certainly not trained historians. And for that matter, neither is the Supreme Court of the United States, nor the very bright law clerks that work for the court. But that's exactly the kind of analysis you have to engage in. So not, why not hire as a special master, a historian who can take a look at the history of firearms regulation? I mean, at least have to go back to Magna Carta. And if you really want to get a handle on how malleable history and tradition is, take a look at what you probably read, right? I guess you did probably in common law, you read McDonald versus city of Chicago. So we have Justice Stevens taking a look at the same history and tradition that the majority is looking at, Justice Scalia. So, uh, what does history and tradition tell you? You can arrive at completely different results. You can manipulate history and tradition. I mean, that's really the drawback. And talk about being selective as far as facts are concerned. Obviously, the justices are quite selective as far as history and tradition is concerned. So maybe the better view is to take the position, and I've always thought that this was eminently reasonable, the position that Justice Kennedy took in Lawrence versus Texas <clears throat> in 2003. He says history and tradition is a starting point, but it's not the end point. That's the Texas homosexual sodomy case. All right, so history and tradition may be the starting point, but it's not necessarily the end point. Um, but history and tradition has, has a certain allure because it seems to be an objective way of constant determining what the Constitution should say. But then there are two sort of basic versions of the Constitution. And, and uh, I've always been impressed by this division, Justice Brennan's opinion in Michael H. versus Gerald D. Question of whether or not the natural father ought to have visitation rights in the California case. Um, it's not a custody case. He's just looking for uh, visitation rights. And Justice Scalia suggests that you need to look at the narrowest history and tradition. Now, the rest of the court doesn't buy into that. History and tradition, yes, but not the narrowest history and tradition. And Justice Brennan said, what kind of a society do we want to have? Do we want to have a society that's homogeneous and assimilative? Or do we want to have a society that's pluralistic, and facilitative, which kind of society do we want? And depending on your answer to that, you might choose 
an originalist interpretation or an interpretation that emphasizes that this is a living constitution and the constitutional interpretation really has to be considered in light of changing circumstances. In some areas of the law, that's certainly the case, constitutional law. In the Eighth Amendment, for example, we used to freely kill minors, freely kill people who were mentally disabled. Now it's unconstitutional. So what's changed? Um, and the court acknowledges in the Eighth Amendment area the changing conditions and emerging awareness, as Justice Kennedy called it in Lawrence versus Texas, if there's an emerging awareness that rights are changing, then shouldn't the Supreme Court be responsive to those rights? That's the other view. But as I say, history and tradition has a certain allure because it seems to be an objective analysis. But as you point out, in that Second Amendment case, it's, it's not so much. And so what the court's doing is saying, look, if that's what I got to do, and that's a really interesting case, by the way, uh, if that's what we have to do, then let's hire somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, but then on the other hand, you see the three decisions that I noted in the uh, slides from lower federal district courts, most recently from Judge Counts in the uh, Western District of Texas. I mean, it's a straight history and tradition analysis. And if you want to see a really radical sort of opinion, I mean, just read the first couple of paragraphs of that case. Now, if you're Second Amendment and a gun rights advocate, <clears throat> then you're going to absolutely agree with it. But um, there's no balancing of rights. Public safety is irrelevant unless history and tradition supports the regulation. So forget about regulating people who are under uh, protective orders who can't have access to firearms. And why? Why do we have that kind of legislation? Well, to protect the people who get killed, mostly women, by people who are under protective orders who violate those orders and kill people. We don't want them to have access to firearms. It's a pretty good public policy balancing. History and tradition doesn't permit that. Anyway, um, it's quite interesting the case that you uh, that you raise. I thought that was a very innovative approach by the judge. John. Yeah, I'm going to ask for your um your forecasting here. I did ask MKS this earlier in the day, but he said he's done um trying to forecast how the Supreme Court is going to take stuff. Um, so more v. Harper. Um, what's your pessimism index on the little thing called democracy? Well, I fear we both, by the way, have the same initials. I'm at Conar Steinberg, MKS. My middle initial is Kent, or middle, oh. not middle name. <laughs> um, I fear, I fear for what's happened. Uh, I grieve for what's happened to the Voting Rights Act, and I fear for what's going to happen in this particular case. Um, if, in essence, there's a deference to the kinds of determinations that led to this, um, it's called, I don't know if you've heard the term, uh, cracking and packing, to minimize the power of black votes. Um, there's nothing left of the Voting Rights Act, very little left of the Voting Rights Act now. And, and I fear that the Supreme Court uh, is going to put the cap on it. And if that's the case, then it's just an open season. The Voting Rights Act is effectively meaningless at this point. Um, I don't have high hopes. I have hopes, but they're not high. Kind of grim to leave us on. I don't know, I don't know if anybody else has a question that might spark some optimism, but Appreciate the time you spent with us tonight. Sorry for the Hey, you know where to find us if you got questions, right? Karen? Uh, just one last thing. You did a really good review of the Dobbs case. And I know when the leak came out and then when the decision was finally announced, it was very, um, I don't want to say destructive, but um, now that people have had time to look at it, is it still legally a, a really destructive thing? Or are people thinking that it was a well-reasoned correction that needed to be made because the court overstepped the first time? I, I just, I, I no idea. I'm interested in the legal part of it, not so much the emotional part of it. <laughs> 
if you're and an original I know there's listener. there's a theory that a motion can't be taken out of it, but that's where I am. Now, if you're an originalist, uh, absolutely, this is a great, uh, great decision. Um, if you're pro-life, this is a great decision. Um, so again, from the standpoint of originalism, it's a very well-reasoned uh, opinion. Um, what it does is to turn the entire abortion issue back really to the states because of the inability of the federal Congress, especially after the midterms now, to enact legislation that's going to uh, protect abortion. So you have to decide the question on a state-by-state -state basis. If you're in Minnesota with Doe versus Gomez from 1995, then there's protection under the Minnesota Constitution. But, you know, it's really, it's really interesting. And someone raised the question about Justice Scalia smiling. You know, he might be smiling because he would say, well, this is exactly what's supposed to happen. State legislatures are deciding to protect abortion rights. Some state legislatures have backed off more serious regulations of abortion rights because legislators have now listened to the people. Um, so you see in Kansas, uh, for example, backing away from restrictive abortion legislation. And you're not seeing so much of that now. I think once the, once the uh, clamor of the midterms is over, now we'll see what happens in the red states. But are those legislators going to continue to take extremely harsh positions with respect to abortion? You've got a lot of states embedding abortion rights either in the state constitution or in legislation. So Justice Scalia would say, this is exactly what I said should have happened. It should go back to the states and the people who live in those states. The practical impact of Dobbs, most of the abortions that are performed uh, early during pregnancy are now medical abortions. And many people are getting abortion pills legally or illegally from Europe, and they're taking those pills. So most of the abortions are chemical abortions. And it really doesn't make any difference what a state says that people have access to those pills. So the impact of Dobbs um, on the ability of people to get abortions is really uh, questionable. But I think it's the ideological hit that's really, really hard to, uh, uh, to take because this is, this is originalism really, really driven home. Uh, ever since Roe was decided, that was the goal based upon an originalist analysis, get rid of it. Um, so, you know, it depends on what level you're looking at. As I say, if you believe in originalism and you think that's the ideal line of analysis in constitutional cases, this is a great victory and the court's doing exactly what it should be doing. Um, but if you believe in the concept of a living constitution and agree with Justice Brennan, for example, one of my great heroes on the uh, court, uh, then it's a destructive uh, decision. But it's really interesting as a practical matter to see what's happened. Um, it's become a political issue and it's really interesting to see what's happened in the political process. You see people who are um, absolutely pro-life and they don't want any exceptions at all. And then they start running for office and then they start getting hammered and they think, oh, well, all right, yes, maybe a few exceptions. Now we've seen that in Minnesota, right? So people have to soften their views. That's the political process doing what it should be doing. So it depends on what level, I guess, um, you're looking at uh, and trying to assess the impact of Dobbs. But the ideology is there. I don't know if you were keeping track or making a check every time I mentioned history and tradition, but it now permeates the constitutional analysis in the Supreme Court of the United States. And six justices tend to take that view. That's going to be with us for quite a long time. So you mentioned being destructive. I, and, and Devin will remember this, I was more concerned about the leak than I was about the decision, not because I agreed with the decision, but because I knew the decision would work itself out as far as people reviewing the law and the discussion and all of that would be a fight anyway. But this was the first instance of a leak. Do we care? Does it matter? Is there a rule? I, I haven't heard anything about an investigation or anything since then. Is it, it, it seemed to have died down. Do, do we care if people are releasing discussions ahead of decisions in the Supreme Court? 
Of course we do. Yeah, the, investiga the investigation is still ongoing. All of the cell phones have been co uh, have been collected, and it's an active investigation. Now, I don't know if it was a law clerk. I don't know if they're going to find out who did it. But the investigation continues, and it's a huge issue. The court really does need to be able to operate in secrecy. <clears throat> when they meet after oral arguments, uh, no one else is in that room except the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. And the only way you're going to figure out what happens in those rooms is if a retired justice talks in general terms uh, about what happened. And I think it's really important to the integrity of the judicial process to keep it private. It can't be exposed to the public. And of course, once the opinions are decided, yes, but the nature of the judicial process, I mean, you really don't want that exposed. Having a clerk for a federal district judge, oh my God, um, there are, there are things that that I've seen that affected the decision-making process that I really would not want people uh, to know. And if it really got out, it would it would tend to harm decision-making. It has to be done in, in, in private. Judges are human. There are lots of considerations that are involved. Um, they have to be able to freely discuss what those results are, freely circulate opinions. That's why people thought The Brethren was a book that really tended to put a stake in the heart of the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, but this leaked opinion, I think, is, is absolutely terrible. And I wouldn't expect it to be replicated. Uh, the court doesn't operate in secrecy, but uh, the deliberations that the court engages in um, really have to be kept secret because people do change their minds. Opinions get circulated. Justices persuade other justices. There's sort of a little bit of log rolling. Uh, take this particular provision out of an opinion, and then I'll then I'll join that opinion. Um, so really, uh, the uh, nature of the deliberative process really should be secretive. I I think in order for the court to function or any court to function effectively, that would be the case. You certainly see that with well, it does make any difference at what level, federal or state. Um, there has to be integrity in the process. And if it's a public process, something's gonna be lost. So I promised Devin, this is my last question then. Do you, have, do you have an opinion then on why no law schools, the ABA, nobody who is supposed to care about the process itself came out against the leak? Why was the leak not an academic issue and a a um, a discussion? Why was it only the decision itself? Well, I don't know. I guess probably the only thing that I can think of is that it's so obvious that leak should not have occurred um, that maybe people thought, why why would you why would you even have to say that? Um, I didn't feel particularly compelled to talk about it because I think that the leak was absolutely um, inappropriate. And so sometimes things are so obvious that you don't even talk about them and you don't need to take a public stand. That's my take. Thank you. 